These hallowed grounds tell a tragic story. One of uncommon heroism and terror from the gilded tower that looms above. Hundreds of people running everywhere in that fear that this was going to just be the first part of a multifaceted attack. Over the last year, much of that night has remained a mystery. We're trying to get more information now. How and why? At first, all we knew was what we saw captured on cell phones. But after a 10 month long investigation by law enforcement, in coordination with MGM, using surveillance videos, body cameras, let's go, radio traffic, coming from upstairs, I see the shot coming from Gangland Bay, and a 3D model. We can now present one of the most comprehensive views of a mass shooting ever. Exposing gaps in our system and showing the response moment by moment. October 1st, 2017. Mandalay Bay security officer Jesus Campos is on a routine security check, assigned to a room alarm on the 32nd floor. This was the last call of my night. You were heading home in your head. In my head, I was home free after this. He has no idea he's about to become an accidental hero on what would become one of the most horrific nights in American history. As shown in this rendering provided exclusively to ABC News by MGM, once on the 30th floor, he takes the stairs up to the 32nd, but finds the exit door jammed. So he walks up to the elevator and takes it back down. When did something seem off to you? Uh, when I noticed the metal L bracket that was secured, that hold the door secured. That bracket, strategically placed there by a man staying in the suite just a few feet away. I didn't know what was going on, just simply because that's not normal. I had a call our security dispatch. I was transferred to engineering dispatch. As he walks back into the hallway to check that room alarm, turns out a nanny a few doors down left their door ajar. He hears a strange noise coming from that suite. I thought it was drill noises. Like drilling? Drilling. The massacre has just begun. Across the street, just moments before, Jason Aldean had taken the stage in the final night of the Route 91 Harvest Festival. Bullets rain down on the 22,000 concert players packed into the open air venue. Confusion mixes with panic. In under a minute, over 100 rounds are fired into the crowd. Concert goers flood 911. There's numerous reports coming in. We have 33 calls holding. It's an active shooter. It's fireworks! Some dispatchers met with chilling silence. Hello, 911. Hello, 911. As the shooter launches his attack, back on the 32nd floor, Campos, who is unarmed, continues walking down this hallway. He passes a room service cart that the shooter is rigged with surveillance cameras. It's either that or the sound of the stairwell door closing that alerts the shooter. He fires through the door and at Campos. I was struck and I went to get cover. I had to take a moment to realize what was going on. Suddenly you're under fire. Yes, I went to go lift up my pant leg and I saw the blood coming down. Campos takes cover in this doorway alcove. There's about a two feet indent. It's enough to lean back and stay back. He radios for help. Hey, there's like five and nine. 32135. The shooter turns back to the concert goers below and fires over 250 more rounds in the next four minutes. Las Vegas Metro Police officers respond to the scene. Control 
Concerned this may be part of a coordinated plot. Deputy Chief Andrew Walsh responds to the scene. What sticks with me is that fear, that pain in my stomach that this was going to just be the first part of a multifaceted attack. Does an uh, active shooter possibly, uh, possibly not confirm uh, terrorist related? But three shooters so far. We get reports of uh, shots fired near New York, shots fired at um, Tropicana. Who knows the diversion tactics or not? Back in the hotel, two key moments are happening almost simultaneously. Across the Mandalay Bay from the shooter's position, guards in the security office are getting news of what's happening at the concert. We have an active shooter. We have an active shooter inside the fairgrounds. Watch as the officers head out and across the casino floor towards an exit door, thinking the threat is outside. Armed units only. Meanwhile, Stephen Schuck, an engineer, is riding an elevator to the 32nd floor in response to Campos's earlier call about that L bracket. Pushing his maintenance cart, he walks out of the elevator and straight into danger. I started to hear the shooting out towards the crowd. Well, I didn't know that at the time. I had no idea what was going on at the time. What did it sound like to you? It sounded like a jackhammer because you'd never expect to hear something like that. I noticed him. I said, get cover. It's not safe. At that moment in time, there was more rounds being dispersed. Suddenly, Shuck himself is under fire. Something hit me in the back as I was jumping in the cover. At the time, I was like, oh, you know, I might be shot. Someone's firing a gun up here. Someone's firing a rifle on the 32nd floor. Those men from the security office hear Shuck's alert and hustle towards the elevators. I thought, if I don't come out of this hallway alive, I wanted to communicate for Metro and first responders to get up there because this is where the shooter is. Every second that Campos and Shuck are under fire on the 32nd floor is a chance for the concert goers below to flee. So all those people had fled in that direction when right. the gunshots rang out. A lot of people did, yeah. I mean, people right. went multiple directions, but not knowing where the rounds were coming from, you know, people fled. For Paige Melanson, running was an agonizing choice. She and her mother were both shot. We rolled her over, um, and a retired firefighter came over, and he told us that we had to go. He said that if we wanted to live, that we needed to go. I looked into his eyes, and, and he said, you need to go, so I did. We were jumping fences, jumping walls, going through. Um, we ended up in the Tropicana. Paige and her sister fled, leaving their mom, Rosemary, behind in the care of a stranger. One time I shot, I fell down. Stephanie and Paige were hanging over me, saying, Mom, just screaming my name, Mom. And next thing I know, my body just floated. Floated up. Did you hear the gunfire? I could see everybody. I could see my, my own body laying down there. The next thing I know, I was in heaven. And um, I saw my dad and my two brothers and my uncle. And it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. You didn't want to come back. 
They just told me it's not your time, Rosemary. You gotta go back. It's not your time. And so the next thing I woke up, I was on a gate that they put me on to drag me to the ambulance. You remember that? Yeah, but only like 20, 20 seconds of it. And then the rest of it, I don't remember nothing. That retired firefighter kept his word, getting her to safety. Oh my God! Hundreds flood into the nearby streets. Where they set up makeshift triage wards. The situation is so dire, police officers step in as paramedics. You see officers stopping to render aid. You see officers bleeding from bullet wounds. Can you get an ambulance here? Real quick, they're all coming right now. Okay, you see you got a gunshot to your lungs. The injured carried away any way they can. Oh my god. Right now, we need your truck. We just need to get people over to the hospital, okay? Okay. And we have room in here, we have room for one in the next. In the midst of the chaos, police work to keep everyone calm. Stay in there, please. Stay in there. You have your be okay. We'll be back. Started off just like any other normal shift. Uh, Brandon was my trainee that night. It was his second night on the job. Rookie Brandon Engstrom and veteran officer Richard Cole were just beginning their graveyard shift when the shooting began. Our sergeant had the radio on. Shots came out over the radio. So immediately he yells at us to Go to our cars. Just be advised, it is automatic fire. Fully automatic fire from an elevated position. Take cover. While we're driving there, we can hear every time somebody keys up their microphone on duty, we can hear automatic gunfire. As soon as we show up, it's time to go to work. Try to help anybody we could right off the bat. Keep going, everybody, keep going. And then that's when we met Frank, he came over to our car, he's carrying uh, his wife, Giovanna, in his arms, and he said, hey, help me, I'm a police officer. She appeared lifeless. At that point, we obviously knew that this was very critical. I remember within the first 30 seconds to a minute of us driving to the hospital, we heard that an officer had been shot, and Brandon realized that that was somebody who went to the academy with, and I remember just saying, That officer, Brady Cook, who moments earlier had been pinned down with that team of officers under fire. Like Brandon, it was Officer Cook's second day on the job. That all in itself was tough. All I could think was, we have to get Jovan to the hospital immediately. And, and all I wanted to do was help both. Just driving as fast as we can, and Frank's in the back seat, and he's yelling at Giovanna to hang on. One minute, man, one minute. Keep talking to us, press on the Make sure you're doing chest compressions, man. I remember uh, banging on the window, and I hear Brandon in the front, he's telling me to, hey, you know, keep doing chest compressions, and we're almost there. <laughs> Brandon and I carried Giovanna into the hospital at this point, she just had blood, she was bleeding everywhere, like her entire body was covered in blood. And we carried her into the uh, emergency room and I just remember yelling, hey, I have a gunshot wound to the head, where do you want her? Set her down, and that was like the first moment that you had to a chance to take a breath. And I looked down, I'm covered in, covered in blood. I looked at Brandon. He said, What are we doing? 
He said, let's, let's go, we gotta go back. Oh, the lady in the white dress. Inside the Mandalay Bay, Stephen Shuck, the engineer, pinned down on the 32nd floor with security guard Jesus Campos, have alerted authorities to the shooter's location. Watch for weapons and the people coming out. Police spread out, sweeping through the hotel, looking for other threats. You got two behind you already. Put your police radio down Waking stunned guests in the process. Sir, are you hurt? Clearing rooms, floor by floor. Ten minutes have passed since the first gunshot. By this point, the shooter has gone quiet. On the 32nd floor, Shuck and Campos escape to safety as police and security work to get the guests out of their rooms. One coming down. Go, go, go. Run, run. What is that car? They worry that room service cart is rigged with a bomb. You have police officers on a floor, and what are they confronted with? And they find out if it's a two-story security one. They get close enough to that room, there's wires, there's cameras. What are they walking into? Is that an IED? Is there more than one person? How many people are there? We had nothing. Let's go. One floor below, a SWAT team makes their way to that stairwell. Shield up, shield up. You guys are doing a phenomenal job, by the way. Beers are on me later. Metro! Right next to the shooter's room, they game out how to make entry. They force open that bolted door. Kill the light, concealing their position, and rig the door to the suite with an explosive strip. Then a warning. Everyone in the hallway needs to move back. All units move back. Breach, breach, breach. They find the shooter dead by a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Weapons scattered about. They prep a second breach to clear the adjoining room. In both rooms, over a thousand gun shell casings and an unimaginable cache of weapons. Over. Guys, take the point on. Guys, the thing's okay. We took, he's dead, okay? Go straight down to the side. I mean, Jim. Poor lady. Hey, guys! Hey! News spreads across the hotel. They went in, and then the doors were and then cleared after that. For the thousands of guests that have been sheltering in place, excuse me, I'm sorry. Relief. We have no control over the actions of evil people, but we're here now. Thank you. A devastating national tragedy in Las Vegas, claiming 58 lives and leaving hundreds injured. As a nation, it's as if we've grown desensitized to the horror of mass shootings. But the Las Vegas massacre seemed different. The deadliest mass shooting in American history. The shooter from his perch high up and far away. 
exposing the fact that nowhere is too far or too secure for a bullet's reach. For days, the festival grounds remain frozen in those moments of terror. As authorities work to calculate the totality of the disaster. It's hard to comprehend what happened, even to this day. The final toll, staggering. 58 dead, over 850 injured. The deadliest mass shooting in modern American history. After the shooting, we went back and then our next job was to clear the concert grounds and look for anybody who was still alive and hiding. And then after that was done, our, our job for the rest of the morning was actually standing over <clears throat> standing over some people who were passed away over until the coroner could come and pick them up until about eight in the morning. Later that morning, they head back to the hospital to check on Officer Brady Cook and that young woman they had carried in. I said, let's, let's go down to uh, trauma and see if we can get the name of the girl that we brought in. I thought for sure that she probably didn't make it. And then we talked to a nurse and I said, hey, you know, we brought this girl in last night. She was, oh yeah, I remember her. And they said, she's up on like the third or fourth floor in the ICU. And I was stunned that she was still alive. We went up to uh, the neural ICU and saw her laying and <clears throat> Going to the hospital and learning that she's actually still alive was kind of like sunshine to a dark day. I saw it in their face that they were they were hurt by this and they could you know and I kept telling them you know hey, be proud you know you guys got my wife here. For Frank and Giovanna Calzadias. Their swift actions meant the difference between life and death. You know, there's nothing but love for those two guys. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I'm speechless. I, I don't know what words to say to them that I'm grateful. They saved my life. In the days after the attack, the dark portrait of the man at the center of the massacre came into focus. The shooter, 64-year-old Stephen Paddock, a retired accountant and real estate investor, at one point a net worth of just over $2 million. But the scale and scope of what he did and how he did it remained a mystery. September 25th, 2017, Security camera footage captures Paddock arriving at the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino six days before the attack. He's a high roller, a regular at the hotel. He was a very typical guest. He was, in our estimation, the lowest risk type of individual. No alarm bells going off. Paddock checks into a suite on the 32nd floor, and he's given the VIP treatment, allowed to bring his luggage up through a service elevator. He just looks like a middle-aged guy with a lot of luggage going up to a room. In the Mandalay Bay, a sprawling metropolis of restaurants, nightclubs, and over 100,000 square feet of gambling, he is only one man in a sea of thousands. Over the course of the next six days, under the ever-watchful eyes above, Paddock moves about the hotel, where he's known to gamble tens of thousands of dollars at a time. He can be seen playing the slots, making a purchase at the resort shop, and leisurely walking around. He preferred to play video poker machines. He would uh, stay at that for uh, hours on end. And spend the nights here? Yes. Literally through the night. Over the course of his stay, he makes several trips to his house in Mesquite, Nevada, and brings in case after case after case of luggage. 21 suitcases in all, full of guns and ammunition. Four days into his stay, he checks into an adjoining room on the 32nd floor using the name of his girlfriend. Authorities say he'd already wired $150,000 to her in the Philippines. 
Finally, the investigation shows on October 1st, he orders room service and rigged those surveillance cameras before he brings in a final batch of suitcases and locks himself in his room. This will be the last known footage of Stephen Paddock alive. Since the night of October 1st, the story of what happened in this hallway on the 32nd floor has only been talked about, never seen, until now. Jesus was coming here to check this door, which had been left ajar by a nanny who wanted to check on the kids across the hall. Chunks of wall are missing because it's been taken out as evidence because shrapnel and bullets were flying down this hallway, shot from all the way in the other end. And as we get closer to where the shooter was hiding out, you can see more of the debris, more of the drywall, more of the soot. Behind this door, investigators would find 24 weapons ranging from AR-15s with bump stocks to AR-10s with armor-piercing bullets, which are legal to buy, but illegal to sell. He fired more than a thousand rounds in 10 minutes, but he still had over 5,000 rounds of live ammunition. A person can, in our country can go out and buy that many weapons and not break the law until one of those kills a human being is, is a challenge for law enforcement. A lot of people looked at the arsenal and said, how could a man bring that much of an arsenal into a hotel. If my first response to that is there are thousands of people walking through the front door, our back door, uh, from the parking garage with luggage. We greet and welcome. And our first priority is to say welcome. We're glad you're here. That's our first responsibility. Once I saw the arsenal that was up there, uh, it's sickening. <laughs> Since the attack, the Mandalay Bay has implemented new security measures. There are clearly random checks going on. How are dogs being used? Well, I think typically as a canine program to basically screen for things that we are concerned about. And authorities say casinos are now monitoring their visitors more closely. The casino industry is a fantastic partner for our town. The changes they've made with room checks and with who they're allowing to have rooms that overlook outdoor venues, both on the Strip and in downtown. They've been great partners for us. But now, more than a year later, we still don't know the answer to the big question. Why? What do you know definitively about his motive? Yeah, nothing. Other places have had mass casualty incidents where the shooters and gunmen have left behind manifestos. In this case, we just don't have that. The shooter may have taken his motive to the grave, but MGM says the massacre was still clearly an act of terrorism that the company argues they're not legally responsible for. Last summer, they made the controversial decision to sue over a thousand victims of the Las Vegas attack. Citing a law passed after 9-11, MGM has gone to court arguing they are not financially liable because the security company they hired for the concert was federally certified against terrorist attacks. Survivors of the Las Vegas massacre now speaking out after they're now being sued by the owner of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. Boycott the MGM. Company, aware of the backlash, says that MGM's lawsuit is simply a legal maneuver and not meant to be an insult to those who were injured or killed in the attack. You've got hit with a lot of negative headlines in the past few months. What do you want the public to know? Well, I think uh, the main thing you want us to know is that uh, uh, this, is a, this is a small city, uh, and it's a big family. The community depends on Mandalay Bay. We're a community serving a community, and so uh, that is our focus. We can mourn what's going on, but we want to work together to look to the future and that there's hope. The lawsuits are currently suspended while MGM and the survivors involved are in mediation. Survivors like Rosemarie Melanson and her two daughters, Stephanie and Paige, it has been such a year for you guys. We first talked to the Melansons last year, just a few days after the attack. They say it grazed about an eighth inch or so deep. Paige was shot in the arm, but her mother Rosemarie's injuries were far worse when Paige and her sister were forced to leave her in the care of a stranger. Tell me what that bullet did to her body. Well, it came in from the upper right uh, chest, and then it uh, went sideways, and it severed where the esophagus meets the stomach. It broke some ribs. It tore through her intestines, but hit her liver, her spleen, um, and then when she was on life support in that first week, she was going into kidney failure as well. My mom's always been there for us, and so her not talking back to us, that was the hardest part for me. 
As part of their own healing process, the Melanson sisters relied on the Las Vegas dance studio they own. Dance has always been an outlet for us, and whether we're happy, those emotions come through. If we're upset, those emotions come through. That is our way to express ourselves. You broke it down and tired. On her first day back to work after the attack, Paige let those emotions lay bare through dance. I chose the song Rise Up. It just felt so good to move again and so good to interpret, you know, what I had been feeling over the last three weeks. What were you feeling in that moment? Relief, because doctors had said that, you know, it was going to be a long road, but my mom was going to make it. Okay. After nearly a year spent in and out of the hospital, <laughs> Rosemary is heading home for good. We're going to miss you, girl. But the road to full recovery for Rosemarie will be a long one. Just last month, the Department of Justice allocated close to $17 million to assist those affected by the shooting, money that could help families like the Melansons. What did you learn about your wife through all this? Well, um, how resilient she was how strong a person she was. What did you learn about yourself during all this? That I'm stronger than I thought I was. And what have you learned about your family? That they're stronger than what they, what I gave them credit for. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems everywhere you look, one year on, signs of that strength throughout the community. The city of Las Vegas came together almost as one big family and they're still supporting each other uh, despite the, the tragic event that happened. People still walk down the street, especially tourists on the Strip. They see us and they thank us for everything we do. All the first responders, paramedics, EMTs for responding so fast. And also the people on the ground that were getting injured people into their vehicles and taking them to the hospital. I just thought that those, to me, are just my heroes, you yeah. know. You saved countless lives down below. What goes through your mind when you think that? Just doing my job. I did it to the best of my ability, and then some. These two unlikely heroes, now back to work, carrying with them one solemn vow. I feel like I got a second chance. 58 people didn't. I need to live a good life to honor them.